Hello, Susanna. So yeah, we're going to talk about roadmaps, going beyond the now, next, and later roadmap. Because fundamentally, your roadmap doesn't need to look like this. It doesn't need to look like this. It doesn't need to look like this, which is pretty much what 99.99% .99 of the roadmaps in the world look like, one of those three patterns. So who am I? Why am I speaking to you? Well, my name's Phil Hornby. I'm a product coach. I was lucky enough to get to spend three days with Marty Kagan a couple of years back with Tim Bustra and also, um, oh, who else was it? It was Nacho, who I know have been here and spoken to you guys as well. It was an awesome few days um, where he picked, in theory, 50 of the best product coaches in Europe something to live up to. And what's already been said in advance of, the, of me getting on the stage is something to live up to, right? I have this fundamental mission to help entrepreneurial product teams. And for me, the product manager is the entrepreneur in the room in most organizations. They bring that business, that drive, that hustle to actually drive things forward and make them successful. And so that's kind of the mission behind everything I do. And I've got a Nice little business name for four product people. If you've ever read the books for dummies, this is the equivalent. Everything I do is for product people. I'm not suggesting product people are dummies though. Now you might be listening to my accent and thinking, that's not a typical British accent. That's not the one I'm used to. That's because I'm from the sovereign nation of Yorkshire. We have a reputation for not liking to spend very much money. So just pretend we're Schwabian and it'll all make sense. Now the chances are your roadmap sucks. And I would take you through all the reasons why it sucks, but that's another talk that I gave last year. But if anyone would like to watch it, grab, scan the QR code and it'll uh, take you to a recording of it. You can watch it later. Or just find me on LinkedIn and I'll share it with you. I probably didn't give you enough time to scan though. So let's start with a really quick question. Who knows what a now, next, later roadmap is? Yeah? What is it? <laughs> can, can someone give me an answer? One, one potential way of interpreting it, yeah? And anything else from anyone else? <laughs> Any other takes on it? I'm just going to give you a hint. That's the start of how I do sessions like this. I want you to speak. I have done so many discovery interviews and so much coaching. I can be silent for longer than you can. I promise you. So who uses a now, next, later roadmap format? At least one, two, three. Okay, we've got a few that maybe not got to everyone yet. What do you use instead? Serious question, what do you use instead? <laughs> ah. Uh, just out of interest, how many of you, of you have read the roadmaps, Product Roadmap Relaunch book by Bruce McCarthy and C. Todd Lombardo? Okay. If you haven't, go and read it. I, I'm lucky enough to spend most of my life collaborating with Bruce these days, and he is about to start on the second edition. But it kind of busts so many myths about bad roadmaps. And, but I'm going to say one thing, a Gantt is not evil in the right context. It's this classic product answer, it depends. But I will quote Bruce on something here. 
The Gantt chart was invented by Henry Gantt when working on the project for building the Hoover Dam. It was delivered late. Like you've just said, now, next, and later is really just about the timing. How do you show time on your roadmaps then? If some of you have got now, next, and later, some of you have got Gantz, is it just a timeline? Dates? Quarters? Themes? Okay, yeah. We're going to come back to that as a content element in a, in a little bit. Okay, so we've got quarters. So we've got, I guess, what I call a time box. And this is what I think about as your timing and maturity for your roadmap. Timeline, time box, time frame, you might call it horizons, it's another way of phrasing it. Hint, if you are here, trying to go straight to there is not going to work. You are changing too much too quickly. So you might try using quarters, half years. Heck, I don't think I've ever done a roadmap that wasn't that style, and I was roadmapping 20 years ago. I mean, I'd say, more recently, I've done now, next, and later, but 20 years ago, I was just doing quarters, half years, full years. Because we recognize the risk on timeline, the risk on hitting those deadlines. And there's a, actually, I just used an interesting word there. I used the word deadline. A deadline is different to maybe a target release date. A deadline is a real thing, hopefully. If it's a made-up deadline, as many managers do, then, yeah, okay, we'll just keep going by. Uh, I forget whose quote this is. I love deadlines. I love the sound of them as they wish by. I wish I could claim that joke was my own. So if we think about now, next, and later, it really is about the timing. That's number one of the seven elements I'm going to talk about in terms of when you're thinking about what your roadmap is made up of. Just timing, and we're talking about now, next, and later. And that seems to be the holy grail for everyone. What most people, when they say now, next, and later, really mean is an outcome-driven or an outcome-oriented roadmap, shifting from features to outcomes. We'll kind of unpack that as we go along. But I know I also promised you 12 different visuals, and I'll get back to those at the end. So number two of the things you really need to consider with your roadmap is the context. The why the heck are we doing this? The competitors, the vision, the mission, <coughs> the objectives. How does this, does this all line up? If you can't show that this thing on your roadmap is contributing to this objective that you have, why is it there? or aligns with this strategic level theme, why is it there? Ideally, it aligns with both of them, but not always. In fact, I often like to have three points of contact, a strategic theme, an objective, usually in the form of an OKR, and a product principle, which is a concept from a guy called Martin Erickson, who founded Mind the Products, so thank you, because he created the, the series of events. And they are a way of kind of codifying decisions that we make as an organization. So that when we find ourselves in a position of saying, what should I do? Instead of having to have the debate every single time, you know as an organization what your direction is. In fact, I love them so much that kind of, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a book about product decision making and that's one of the chapters. But there, if, if you've ever dealt with say eBay, they have a product principle as an organization. We favor the buyer over the seller. So if there's ever a decision that needs to be made that could go either way, there's a default answer. They've had the debate as an organization. They know where they're going. And that provides context as to how things line up as an organization, why it fits, why it makes sense, and it's consistent for them. The audiences. Who looks at your roadmap? Customers, execs, 
shareholders, yeah. Maybe investors as well, total separation maybe. <laughs> In fact, I would make an argument that the product team, and by that I mean the cross-functional team, owns the roadmap. The, rod the product manager doesn't. The team owns it. It is a team artifact. The product manager just happens to do all the admin work. The smallest unit of value delivery in any product organization is the product team. The product manager can't do anything on their own. The engineers can build something on their own, but it's probably the wrong thing. The designers can make something pretty on their own, but it's probably solving the wrong problem. As all together, we get that synergy. And that's why it's got to all be aligned and all owned complete together. Now, there may be one person driving it, doing the admin work. Although, I do tend to prefer product managers to do as little admin as possible. Like, I don't want a product manager to ever touch the backlog which I know is a controversial statement. I definitely don't want them writing stories that are any lot smaller than an epic. But that's because I want to empower the team to be doing a lot of that other work. But every audience is different. Every audience cares about something different. So how the heck can you have one artifact and use it with them all? I stole this one from Jana Bastow, who is the inventor of the now next and later roadmap, and the found, one of the founders of Mind the Product and also of product, Podpad. And what she identified is that there are public things that will tell external people, and there are private things or internal things, and different groups care about them. There's a level of detail, a level and a high level. Like, honestly, the execs do not care about the detail of the stories. The care that you're solving the problems and driving the right outcomes. The developers, on the other hand, they want to understand what we're really planning to do, how it all comes together. We can't tell our customers or the general public all the detail because there are things we are doing that are maybe confidential. But I think this misses a fundamental element the time horizon as well. Execs care about the long term. They want that five-year roadmap, maybe three years, depending on the context, because they want to see the direction of travel. They want to know that it were aligned and going the same direction. If I show that to my developers, they're just going to laugh me out of the room. So we, we've got to think about our audience and how we present it. And so much so that my uh, co-host and I are talking roadmaps, which I didn't mention earlier, I'll come back to later. I've developed a thing called the Roadmap Audience Canvas, which helps us understand and define who our audience are, what their needs are, to help us then say, well, does this artifact fulfill those needs? How are we aligning around it? Because ultimately, we've got to think about communication being for the audience, not for the sender. Then we've got content. You mentioned themes. So what do you put on your roadmap? We've got themes as one possibility. What else could we put on there? Outcomes, absolutely. Now, outcomes an interesting phrase. What do you mean by an outcome? And so that's what I would call a product outcome. It's a change in customer behavior, as Teresa Torres would define it. And absolutely. But if I'm showing this to a customer, do they give a damn about that? So, and there's a, so there's a second type of outcome, a user outcome, otherwise known as a job to be done. And those are really powerful to roadmap because you know, we all say that the roadmap keeps changing constantly. The jobs that be done that your customers have got don't. They're pretty dang stable. 
It's just the solution that we figure out that's going to address that job to be done that changes over time and that we discover a better way of solving it through. If you still deliver the user outcome for them, has your roadmap changed? And that's a way of getting some of the churn out of changing your roadmap constantly. Here's the, here's the list I come up with when I do it. So you might put a need on there. Again, a problem. You might use the term opportunity for sort of many of these as well. Anyone read Continuous Discovery Habits? See a few nods. So that's Teresa Torres' language. Themes is Bruce McCarthy's language. Heck, some people would still just call them requirements. Language can be a barrier to communication sometimes, the words we use. Um, at Mind the Products last year, I was on a panel, and one of the other panelists told an awesome story about how they got their stakeholders on board with discovery. They did it by changing the language. They stopped talking about discovery, which had this bad reputation of just taking forever and never getting results, and started talking about due diligence. Because this company did a lot of M&A. But the reality is that's what it is. It's about managing risk. And due diligence is the language that their business colleagues used when they were talking about managing risk. Discovery is the language we use when we talk about managing risk. But sometimes you need to translate for that audience. And yeah, we might have problems. We have benefits, jobs to be done, user outcomes. Ultimately, we're trying to identify fundamental problem or need, what, what we want to fulfill for the customer to make their life better, that it's ultimately going to move the needle on the outcomes that we're trying to drive. And so fundamentally, we're telling a story. Those jobs we're going to do, those user outcomes we're going to fulfill are solving a problem for a customer. And in that story, your customer it's the hero. Think about it as Mario. I'm sure most of you have played Mario at some point in your lives. But when Mario goes and hits that block with a question mark on, a fire flower comes out. Your product is the fire flower. With that fire flower, the customer becomes a hero. That's what you're aiming for. And you're telling them the story about how you are going to Take them there. How are you going to enable them to do so much more, be so much more effective? You're probably going to put some justification in there. And for me, this is part of the story. Why the heck is this thing on my roadmap? Explain the why. Now, some of that's going to be internal. You're not going to tell that to customers. Others are going to be externally focused. We're doing this because. X, Y, and Z reason. We're doing AI because, frankly, it's a trend in the market at the moment. And if we haven't got it, our investors won't give us any more money. 18 months ago, if you didn't have Web3 on there, same answer. Five years ago, if you didn't have augmented reality on there, same answer. We go through these trends and these loops. Let's see where AI is in two years' time. It may have done some amazing things. It may not. I'm sitting on the fence right now. Because I don't care about AI. AI is a solution. What's the problem I'm solving? What am I enabling for our customers to make them kick butt? And then lastly, visualization. I'm a big fan of visualization. And as I get older, what I realize is the things that I did when I was younger, how much influence they've had on me. Does anyone remember stories about the Apple Mac and how it had the best fonts on it ever? Or at least back in the day. And you know the reason why that happened? Steve Jobs took a class in typography at college because he thought it was interesting. And he explored that subject and thought, we should enable this in that user interface. We should enable that richer experience, that more expressive experience. Visualization is something I did a ton of when I was 16, 17, 18, 
before I went and became an engineer and did it far more structured things. And to me, I, what I've realized is how strong a tool it is in storytelling and supporting the story. Like you'll notice my slides have not got a ton of text on them, like a lot of corporate slide decks. Because the presentation comes from here, this is the support material. That's what it always should be with a presentation. There's a few little hints, like this is reminding me where I am in my sequence. Because first time I've delivered this talk, so I might have forgotten what was coming number six and number seven. So how do you visualize your roadmaps? Not at all. So internally, but what do you do externally then? Always PowerPoint. So I haven't used the new Jira discovery tool. I tried to stay tool agnostic. Um, I have heard some good things and I know another one of uh, people, Tim and I spent some time with is definitely is working on that these days. So uh, I guess it'll probably turn out awesome. I have to be honest, I just generally have this aversion to Jira because I remember it as a support tool for ticket management. And so I, I can't get over it becoming the standard work management tool, plus your roadmap and your road and your backlog are two distinctly separate things to me. One influences the other, but they're not the same thing. And uh, yeah, I've never seen it. I haven't done it, seen it done well. I know a bunch of people use ProdPad. Like my co-host on the YouTube channel, he's an XR hard guy. They've literally just launched their now, next, and later function about a month ago. Finally. Uh, but there's a ton of people that use it. And in my last role at Continental, we chose Aha. It fitted our context and our use case. We evaluated everything that was out there at the time. And that was the one that best fitted our needs. We had a ton of hardware involved with what we were doing. Hardware has hard timelines. It worked. <laughs> but I generally, I mean, I had also Miro over there. I'm generally on that low tech solution these days. Miro, Mural, PowerPoint, Keynote, Google Slides, because of the flexibility. Because I haven't found anything that allows me to create the visual that gives me the storytelling I want. I hope that we will do eventually. Heck, I've even considered starting a business and that being the product I create. But then I have to integrate with every one of those road mapping tools out there, and that'd just be a pain. Because I don't want to create the whole road mapping tool. I just want to create the visual layer. But then maybe Pendo would acquire me. They're quite good at that at the moment. Ultimately, the problem I've got with not using a tool, though, is I want probably five different views that's generally where I land today. One for my execs, one for my developers and operations team, one for my sales team, one for my partners slash existing customers, and one for prospects, because there's different levels of trust there. And so that's kind of how many views. That's a lot of work. I was talking to someone the other day who said, before they implemented AHA in their company, we're going back 10 years, they were going through a particular period where they were working a 100 hour week and 80 hours of that was just keeping the roadmap in sync. And that's wrong. It should be a single source of truth and multiple views. And for me, if I'm spending more than 30 minutes a month, ideally a quarter, maintaining the artifact, then I'm getting something wrong. I'm doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure I can do it that quickly. What I'm actually doing is focusing on the road mapping, the decision making that is product management. And then creating the artifact should be trivial because I've already made the decisions. I already know the answers. I'm making a picture. 
to support the communication I'm going to do from that point forwards. And so I've got a bunch of random roadmaps. One of the, uh, one of the workshops I sometimes run, we, has anyone here ever done a design sprint? So you know, lightning demos. Why well, do lightning demos and a design sprint essentially for road, your roadmap? So you'll go and scour the web to find lots of different examples of what roadmaps look like. And so they do my research for me. Wonderful. Here's one example. It's kind of Gantt chartish with some blobs which could be kind of feature releases. They might be milestones. They might be deadlines. Go back to that deadline concept. It's useful sometimes. When GDPR came in, it wasn't a negotiable date. It happened on a date you needed to be ready. That's a real deadline. You could take a, you, you could take a risk based approach, but in the case of GDPR, with it being a revenue based percent, a percentage of your global revenue, it wasn't worth taking. Oh, if we look at someone like Uber, they definitely take more of a, eh, we won't worry about the law for a while, and then when people catch up, we'll deal with it. Or at least they did it in the early days. So, yes, you can make that choice, but it was a real deadline. That if you if you made the choice to be compliant, you had to hit it, and so I'm cool with that. There are certain cycles and rhythms in your industry. If anyone works in ed tech with schools, you need to have your new product available by June, so they can buy it before the summer, so you, it's then ready for September when the school year starts. That's not a negotiable. If you release a smartphone, it needs to be in the networks by October. Note, Apple announces it September, October every single year. Because in November, December, no, no mobile network will take a new mobile phone and qualify it. Because it's their highest sales period of the year. They won't entertain it. So you've got a real market-driven date that you need to work for towards based on a rhythm or an event. Knowing that, recognizing, heck, your own company will have events and have rhythms. Heck, we're at Mobile World Congress is this week. There's a lot of people that have had to have some things ready for that, even if it's all smoke and mirrors. And I've done a lot of augmented reality smoke and mirrors for CES in the past. But we, you know, this is telling a story. And in some context, this would be right. Here's another one. This is more of a board style. And in fact, I'd argue this is not a roadmap. This is a release plan, which is a different artifact. Quote John Cutler, the most, one of the reasons most roadmaps are bad is that we ask them to do too many jobs. Instead of saying, we'll have a roadmap and a release plan and let them both do both job, their jobs really, really well, we say, well, let's kind of merge them because it's less work. We'll make something that just does both jobs badly. This is another cardish type one. I'm guessing if you clicked on there, you could expand them. You know, some sort of in, some level of interactivity. It looks like it's in a tool. There's some color coding in here. We can see it goes to certain labels. So accessibility redesign, that's UI only stuff, okay? We start to see some themes, some grouping coming through. <coughs> color or rows and things like, excuse me, color and rows and things like that are a great way of adding an extra layer of information. Heck, you might change the icons as well. You might have different audience settings that you can then filter by. That'd be a useful thing, considering different audiences. Although I would, again, argue this is more of a backlog than a roadmap. And if if anyone watches Andrea Sayes' episode on my YouTube channel, you will hear her say that she's going to hunt down and kill anyone who refers to a Kanban roadmap. Which is what some people seem to think a now, next, and later is. One thing is the opposite order. Over here, this is the, this is the stuff that's going to get done. In a roadmap, the stuff that's getting done is over here, usually. 
because time goes left to right in the Western world, at least. Remember, cultural di variations if you're in different audiences, in different audiences, different countries. Here's one that's a little bit different. We've got, we've still got swim lanes, so kind of groupings. We've got more of a radial view. Interesting, we've got more space here. There's more room for doing things, for putting things in. There's less space over here. It constrains what we can present out in the far distance. We don't know what's coming, so there's less space. But you might call this a moonshot, for example, or a more strategic level view. Again, there's times when this is right. The really simple linear, let's take the metaphor all the way. It is a road. This is a road map. We've got four milestones. This is going to happen at these dates. For some audiences, this level of simplicity is right. They don't care or want to care about the ambiguity that is really behind things. I think I interviewed a guy called Nick Black on the channel, and he said, he, and he is an absolute anti-roadmap person. And he was a founder of a startup a few years ago. And he was doing some work in the automotive industry, which I know quite well, having spent 20 years in it. And they were, they were getting a lot of push for, we need a roadmap, we need a roadmap. He said, we don't do roadmaps. And the sales person said to him, okay, you come and tell BMW that. He went into the meeting, very strong, clear position. He left with, and he said, yes, I will deliver a five-year roadmap. <laughs> Reality is, those sorts of organizations plan in that sort of cycle time. It takes five to seven years to develop a new car model or new car platform. So those are the planning cycles that they're working in. Yes, things are accelerating, and there's more in the software. Is that defined car space, this sort of thing. Well, that's the fundamental planning cycles of a car, at least historically. And so they want to know you're going the same direction. One of my best ever discovery meetings was a four hour meeting with 11 senior people in General Motors in Detroit. I flew there for less time than I'm going to spend in Cologne, in fact. And I spent an afternoon, four hours with them. I had enough information to make decisions for years to come. They were the single largest automotive company on the planet at the time. They hadn't sold Opal yet. It's like, this is the biggest customer I can find out things from. And you can't go and talk to them every day or every week, like people advocate quite often in discovery. Sometimes you've got to do it in a more of a batch model because that's how the organizations work. That's how the industry works. Doing something more linear like this allowed for a Good conversation. Are we on the same track? Are we going the same direction? Again, another linear one in a simpler model, showing in chevrons. Again, for some people, this would be the right thing. Or here's, here, here we go. I had to get AI in there somewhere. I mean, someone beat me to AI right at the start which meant I won the bingo. This one's even got some nice loops in the roadmap and some more loops and an infinite loop. I, I, this one I struggle with, if I'm honest, but it's the sort of thing you'll see coming out of a government uh, on a white paper. This is the UK's strategic roadmap for AI. This particular one isn't, but uh, this is Accenture. It's pretty much as bad. Here's another one. This one has those swim lanes again. It has stages at a nominal timeline of three years. The bit I pick up from here, though, is the dependencies. Because sometimes dependencies matter. Especially if you've got a large team and you're doing cross-team delivery. Now, I don't want to get into the really deep levels of dependencies, but I want to think, well, this I, it makes no sense to solve this problem before I solve this problem. It's a useful bit of 
shall we say, notation on your roadmap sometimes. This is a simple visualization. Uh, Cambridge University have a group of people that specialize in road mapping, but in the physical product world. Like Rob Fall, who's the guy who's the main sort of person there, he has mapped out the history of road mapping back into the 50s, 60s, 70s at places like Motorola. And one of the things that when we spoke about it, he, he kind of, or we had this realization, there was, there was a fundamental difference in the type of road mapping that many of those companies are doing. The fundamental research has already been done, and the roadmap is about industrialization. Like Intel already know that they can do a three or two or whatever nanometer microprocessor. Now they need to industrialize it into a processor that they can sell to us. So they know they've solved the hard problem. It's a separate activity, that fundamental research activity from the development activity. Now I'm going to hazard a guess that most of you are in the software space. And if you're in the software space, then you're fundamentally doing that creativity and that research at the same time as developing. Because software is a creative activity. If you've written that line of code before to solve that problem, why are you writing it again? And that's what makes it really hard to predict. But there are some things where you can predict, where waterfall is not evil, and waterfall actually is the right solution. Build a bridge, right solution. By analysis and through, through well understood practices like engineering, you can design the right bridge. And you do that up front and then go and build it because you can't put a version one up and it fall down. <laughs> Although I guess there are experiments there. You, know, you look at people like Tesla and SpaceX and they are doing a bit more of an iterative experimental thing. Although if you look back at NASA in the day, they also blew up a lot of record rockets as they were experimenting to figure things out. We just have all forgotten about that because it's not in the news every day. Oh, Elon Musk has wasted another billion. No, he's learnt. If he, if he fails to learn, then he's wasted it. If he's actually learnt the things that he was aiming, setting out to learn, same as we do in product, we haven't failed. Here's my new favorite, actually. It's the radial. It's a bit of a sparse one, is this particular one. You've still got swim lanes. You've got now, next, and later, maybe, or months. The reason I love this one is it breaks a mental model. The mental model it breaks is left to right being time, which makes people pause and think about it for just that extra two seconds. Like, literally, I've shown this concept to five companies in the last year when I've been working closely with them. Four out of the five have implemented it as their strategic road mapping. Because it kind of says, well, we can't be doing that much right now because, you know, that's the size of the team. And really, it's showing a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of things we could do in the future. And it's accepted that that's what it means. These are things on our radar. Not that we're definitely going to do. And you know, there's some other things shown on here that um, yeah, who it was uh, speaking about it with. But they sh you can show change. This thing has moved. Again, if you're doing if you're doing a quarterly update, a monthly update of your roadmap, show the differences. Don't try and hide it. I promise you, they'll know. They'll pull the old version out of the out of the email that you shared with them, and they'll say they don't look the same. Some of them will just remember. So I worked at McLaren for a while. I worked with a guy called Ron Dennis. I'm sure most of you have heard his name. He is, oh, just a weird, non another level guy. Um, but literally, the guys in the styling studio would make a one millimeter change to the line of the clay car 
as they were testing different ideas. He'd walk in and say, you've moved that, put it back. He just knew he had that much attention for detail in his head. And you will find that there are other people in your organization that at least can spot that level of difference in your roadmap. And here's a really good storytelling one. This is a computer game. Sadly, they've ruined Fallout since my day. It was a, it was a turn-based third-person game back in my day. They've turned into a first-person shooter. Rubbish now. No, but they're making a movie about it, so I might still watch that. But they're telling the story. They've got these different seasons and so on. It's a roadmap. It's doing the same thing. Saying, where is it going? This is a customer one. They don't tell you exactly what's going to be in that season. They give you a highlight headline like there's going to be a load of new leaders, a new group of characters, maybe five new weapons. You don't know exactly which ones. But it's enough to get you interested and think, oh yeah, I'll pay for the season pass. Oh, the opportunity solution tree. I consider this to be a roadmap or can be used as one. If you just think about it a little carefully, if I order things left to right as time, these are the things I'm looking at now, I've got some sequencing. I've also probably got top to bottom on here as well, because I'm probably going to do this experiment first. So he's providing a level of road mapping focused on discovery. And in fact, I would encourage you to include road discovery in your roadmap internally. This is Jana Bastow. Um, she's the creator of the Now, Next and Later roadmap. This was her presenting, I think, at possibly How To Web last year. And, oh, it's uh, gone a little odd. So she's saying, in the now, you've got immediate problem to be solved currently in development, or immediate problem to be solved currently being prototyped. The big issue I find with the now, next, and later roadmap is everyone assumes that the only work is happening here and now. I don't know about you, but in order to deliver something now, I need to have started doing discovery a lot later. But everyone assumes if it's over there, that's when the salespeople, et cetera, start complaining. Oh, it's over here, it's later. You're not doing anything on it. And in fact, even some development teams will look at it and say, oh, it's later, I don't need to do it, do it now. Now, yes, you want to keep the time between discovery and delivery reasonably short, but it takes time to do discovery. It takes time to do what I call exploration as well, which is finding the problems in the first place. So this is kind of how I sometimes work with some of my clients. I've now got a three by three. My delivery is a track of solutions. Right now we are building a solution. That's the solution we're going to build next. And that's the one we'll build later. If we've got a long cycle time. And this is the problem with this is you do start think have to think about cycle time. How long is this the time frame for this? The only discovery, I'm understanding the problem and evaluating the solution. Now, certain problems. So here I'm right. Here I'm writing about solutions, maybe probably with a problem linked to it as well. Down here, I'm going out and I'm exploring. I'm trying to find problems that are worth dealing with. And I, I sometimes just do this as three columns, or three rows, I should say, and take the columns away. Because, quite frankly, the left to right, that timing again, is what messes people up. Oh, I don't need to do it till later. Instead of, I'm exploring right now to find new problems to solve. I'm understanding the problems right now, and I'm delivering solutions right now. So you almost get like a Z pattern, if you use this, going on, of things working their way through the delivery, of this, the explore, discover, and delivery pipeline. So if we think about now, next, and later, that's what you're typically used to putting on the roadmap. 
how many people have gone into a B, how many people are in B2B? How many people have presented their roadmap and the customer said, great, I'll buy as soon as you've delivered that feature that's in the later column? All of the time, yeah. This is, this is the, one of the problems with showing an external, a roadmap externally. Customers have got an excuse to wait because they see that one bright, shiny object over here. What they're forgetting is that there's all of this value that they can have today. What's already in the product? So often, if I'm delivering a customer roadmap, I stop here. I show what's already available, what's now, what we're working on now, and what we're going to do next. I don't go off into this, the long weeds because that allows customers to make a faster decision and understand the value they can have right now instead of waiting, instead of delaying. On the other hand, a strategic picture, we might want to make it really clear what we're never going to do. Because there is a lot of stuff we're never going to do. And we've probably made a load of decisions about that. And every couple of months, that same thing pops back up. But we already killed that one. You didn't, give the, you didn't put the right weed killer on it. So if you show it, these are, thing, these are things we've decided never is probably too strong a word, let's be honest. These are the things we have decided we are not going to do right now. And this is why. Having that context, David Piera calls it the trash. Funny enough, his episode's coming out in about a month's time. And so, again, we, we might slide this window of visibility based on who we're presenting to, what we're presenting. Because, again, it helps that storytelling. What are we trying to communicate? What do we need them to know? And so, I've kind of skirted around it a bit, but I promised you 12 visual styles. Here they are. I gave you three right at the start. The Gantt chart, the board, the tabular style. I call those the classics or the traditionals. We then have the funnel, which widens as you go, go further into the future, shows more ambiguity. You have I say my favorite, the radial, that radiates out from the center. You have the, what do I call it? The crawler. Anyone who's watched Star Wars should recognize that one. It goes off into the distance. <clears throat> we have then a bunch of simple ones, sequential, a road, or I like to call this one the moonshot. And then lastly, we've got, I just put them into miscellaneous because I couldn't decide on a, an overall category name. But you have things that show optionality. Now that's the opportunity solution tree. We might go down different paths. We have here a plot. That might be time versus risk as an example. I've seen a bunch of roadmaps using that. So we show things that are right down in this corner. They're high risk. And a long way off, they're probably not going to ever happen. Whereas over here, low risk, really close to hand, they're going to happen. Down here, close to hand, high risk, maybe it's a technical risk. Maybe it's a market risk. Hey, if you didn't know this as a product manager, you are actually a risk manager. Your entire job is about risk. Discovery is entirely about risk. Should we build it because somebody wants it? Can we build it? It's feasible. Can we make money out of it? It's viable. And will people keep coming back and using it and therefore fuel our business? If you can't answer those four questions, your product's going to fail. 
but I also give them in the order that I typically worry about priority. If nobody has that problem and wants it solved, don't do anything else. This, it doesn't matter whether you can solve the problem. It doesn't matter whether you can make money out of it. And it definitely doesn't matter if anyone's going to come back and use it because they won't because they don't value it. But if you can't deal with those four risks, you haven't got a successful product. Then lastly, call this one the three, the horizons. Um, and broadly, broadly it's based on McKinsey's three horizons concept. Although you could argue that now, next, and later is also very similar to that. Horizon one is your core business. What are you doing for that today? Horizon two is about your growth. Horizon three is about what's your genuine new things that you're doing that will be the business of the future. And you have to measure them in different ways. And that's why they're typically separated this way. Because this one, we measure on profit. This one, we measure on growth. This one, we measure on learning. Which ones do you like and why? We'll go back so you can see the names. The horizons? Why? And I think I, I personally love it in a strategic context. I probably wouldn't use it in a development context as an example. Yeah, you end, you end up over here quite often when you need the detail. Although one of the things I'm also exploring is interactive roadmaps. Like, it's not, if you get into a tool, it is an interactive roadmap, right? But you need to, you need to be able to kind of click through to get to the level of next level detail, to get to the why, to get to the detail of what the solution is. Or the solution ideas, perhaps, if you're just working on problems. What are the experiments we're going to run to validate this problem? That it even exists as a problem that we that this solution is going to work. All those things are not necessarily going to show on page on the page of what you're presenting, the, the details behind it. But depending on the audience, they might want to look at that level of detail. Um, I had a founder I was working with last year. He moved to New Zealand. And bear in mind the startup is based in London. He has basically no overlap time with his team. The communication surface with this guy went through the roof because he's very detail focused. So he's literally got all day long in New Zealand just to read every single ticket, look at everything in every system everywhere. He really cared about that level of detail and was clicking through everything. The ability to have that richness was right in that context. So here's the meta statement. You might need a roadmap for your road mapping. So I'm the host of a YouTube channel, as I mentioned earlier, called Talking Roadmaps, where we interview, well, lots of people. Uh, we had Marty Kagan, we had Bruce McCarthy, we've had C. Todd Lombardo, we've had Jana Bastow, who's over here. Oh, there's Rob Fowle that I mentioned from, um, from Cambridge University. There's Teresa Torres. Matt LeMay, Nacho has been here to talk to you folks. Full of great conversations with people, broadly about road mapping, although I think when I interviewed April Dunford re recently, who's a positioning expert, we kind of went a little bit off piste. Um, check it out if you're interested in hearing more. It's talkingroadmaps.com or on YouTube as well. Just look for Talking Roadmaps. What do I do? I'm a product coach. 
So I help product people be the best through learning, workshops, and coaching, and I won't labor that anymore. If anyone would like to connect with me, if I haven't already connected with you, because I stalked a lot of you on LinkedIn already, um, then you can use that link. Uh, or that code will get you straight through to me. That's me. Uh, I'm over to Q&A now.